Hello everyone, the Instant Camera Guy here and welcome to what will be probably a quicker little video than I would normally do. Um, as you can see, I'm currently midway through refurbishing uh, this, what was formerly a very sad SX-70 Model 1. And, uh, well, this one had some interesting stuff that I was going to do to the shutter that I haven't covered yet. Um, it is an absolute mushroom farm in terms of fungus. Uh, in fact, I'm going to get out my phone here and uh, I'll just try and record some video B-roll of just how bad this lens is. Uh, because the fungus on this particular lens has gone to uh, just about every single facet of the optical assembly. Um, we are talking complete and utter mushroom farm. It is not only on the front cell that focuses, uh, but it has gone into the rear triplet as well. So I wanted to show uh, just what it takes in terms of actually opening that up to access because it is not particularly easy to do. Uh, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about 600 converting a Fairchild shutter. So uh, this particular shutter variant is made by Fairchild instead of PCB. It's an early variant. Uh, I'll probably do a little video on Fairchild versus Texas Instruments PCBs in another video, but effectively, like to keep this as brief as possible, in a nutshell, what happened is uh, there weren't that many manufacturers of circuit boards like this uh, in America at the time that the SX-70 was being invented. And it basically came down to two companies that could do it. One was Texas Instruments uh, of the calculator fame, and the other was a company called Fairchild. And effectively, it was whoever could produce the circuit board for the SX-70 that worked the best at the cheapest possible cost that's who Polaroid was going to go with. And uh, Fairchild figured out how to make it really cheap because they didn't use microchips like Texas Instruments did. So if I get out some spare PCBs here, like this is one from Texas Instruments and it's actually got proper chips, right? Little silicon packages uh, that keep the little uh, electronic control modules and transistors and stuff all safe. Um, Fairchild, in order to meet Polaroid's budget, decided, well, what they would do is put all the components onto this little brown piece of tape and then put a blob of acrylic over it to keep everything intact. Now, that's not as good as silicon. It's certainly not as strong, but it does the job. And uh, yeah, Fairchild started producing PCBs for Polaroid and Effectively what happened, Dr. Edwin Land, he was very good friends with uh, the people at Texas Instruments, uh, the head of Texas Instruments. He was good friends with them. And basically Edwin Land's friend was so irritated that Texas Instruments had lost the brief that I believe TI manufactured these boards at a loss until they could come up with the manufacturing uh, to do it to match Polaroid's cost. So they basically started off production at a loss, knowing that eventually they'd start to profit off producing the boards. And uh, yeah, Fairchild was soon forgotten about. Now, Fairchild PCBs are generally considered less reliable than Texas Instruments PCBs. Um, however, I find it sort of a, a survival bias where if you've got a Fairchild shutter that works, and to be honest, I don't know if this one does. I haven't tested it yet. This came off a, a scrapped camera. Um, but if your Fairchild shutter still works, odds are it's going to keep working. A lot of Fairchild shutters that were swapped early on uh, was because the little transistor array in the blob, a lot of them were just faulty from the factory. And so these would actually get returned to Polaroid and swapped out. Uh, for Texas Instruments ones. Uh, Polaroid spent a lot of time factory refurbing cameras, but when they work, they work really well. And I'd actually argue that a lot of the early Fairchild PCBs work a lot better than uh, Texas Instruments because the electric eye is far less prone to corrosion. And I don't exactly know why, but these just seem to be more accurate in terms of exposure. I, I really rate Fairchild's assuming that they work. Um, 
Well, you know what, I probably, after all that long-winded explanation, I probably don't need to do another video on Fairchild versus Texas Instruments, but in a nutshell, that's the difference. Now, you can convert a Fairchild to take 600 film. Um, instead of swapping out the capacitor that would usually be down this area, we're going to swap out this top resistor instead. Now I have to make a shout out to a Polaroid community enthusiast, I believe he's from Canada, I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Uh, his name is Nick Kandari. He was the one that discovered that, and this is only one or two years ago, so this is really recent information in terms of how to 600 convert these. It was always assumed that this could not be done. And the 600 mod on a Fairchild shutter, Fairchilds use one of two resistor values. One is about 2,700 to 3,000 ohms, and the other one is 10,000 ohms, so a 10K resistor. And you have to measure and figure out which one you have. This is a 10K, so I'm gonna be replacing it with a little surface mount resistor that is 2,700, and then we'll work on that shutter. So I've got the soldering iron nice and hot. Now the good thing about Fairchild shutters is, well, being that the components are surface mounted, I'd argue it's actually easier because you don't really need to desolder as much. You just kind of heat it up and plop the old one off. Um, again, I say that, but you do kind of need good soldering skills to do this. Uh, you certainly need a good set of eyes because this is particularly fiddly work. And as with all the videos that I do, this is pretty advanced repair techniques. Um, I do not encourage you do this if you are all thumbs. Uh, you know, if you are very good with electronics and you're good with mechanical things and you know how to solder, then by all means, go for it. But if you don't have experience with this kind of stuff and you dive into the deep end, uh, you will likely drown <laughs> because these are not difficult. Uh, these are not easy things to work on. I find them pretty easy, but you will too after you've been doing it for 13 years. So caveat emptor, and I say that because the risk of clients breaking their cameras is quite high. It wouldn't be the first time that someone has contacted me and asked for advice, attempted to DIY and then ended up sending it to me anyway. And of course, we all know the old joke about mechanics encouraging people to do their own work first, because it makes the, uh, it makes the repair more expensive. And because I've got OCD, I just want to get that resistor. There we go, totally straight. I must turn off notifications on my phone. I do apologize. I feel like I'm at the movie theaters here. And uh, there we go. We'll just turn off that ringing because it's very, very annoying. I have had people contacting me all day long. There we go. Um, because I have like, <laughs> because I have a really high standard of work, I wanted to make sure that that resistor was like completely square when I soldered it on. Um, of course you don't need to, as long as it connects to both sides, it's gonna work. But my philosophy is, if ever one of the cameras that I've worked on breaks in the future and I'm not around and another repairman has a look at it, I want whoever looks at my work to go, holy moly, that repairman knew what he was doing. And that's just the way that I work. Now, of course, if you want one of your cameras converted to Polaroid 600 film instead of SX-70, well, hit me up because it's a service that I offer free of charge as part of an overhaul. Uh, oftentimes, the capacitors on these things uh, need replacing anyway, but to compensate for uh, electric eye corrosion. Um, so if I'm there, I might as well convert it to 600. 
Now, one of the interesting things about this particular shutter is it is what they call a W shutter. And a W shutter, Polaroid spent a long time figuring out the best way to activate the flash fire assembly, like for flash photos, because they spent many years with basically battling the general public who couldn't figure out the best way to take a flash photo. Um, effectively, uh, the very first generation of cameras, if you put a flash in there, it would constantly fire the flash uh, if you had the flash inserted and you took a photo, even if it was bright daylight. And story goes is that some people complained. They said, oh, that's a waste of a flash bulb. I didn't need the flash bulb. It's bright outside. It would be better if the camera didn't do that. So Polaroid changed the flash fire assembly design to have a bit of feedback from the integration cycle so that effectively if light was really bright outside, it wouldn't waste your flash bar. But then people complained and went, oh, my backlit photos that I'm trying to take with a flash are now silhouettes. <laughs> so Polaroid were like, oh my goodness, I can't win here. Um, and the W was basically a generation of shutters where they decided to do away with the usual cam assembly here Right? There's a what they call the walking arm, and the walking arm attaches to a little piece called the flash cam, which sits over here, and the light dark wheel connects to the arm, which connects to the cam, and during a flash exposure, that's how the aperture gets changed, because that cam basically presses down and stops the blades at whatever certain distance is dictated by the focusing wheel. Now, in the W variants, the cam is still here, but it's not connected to the light dark wheel. They actually have a little bit of plastic that fixes the cam in place. And what they do is they actually modify the PCB either through a diode or a jumper. They modify that PCB uh, so that, I believe the way that it works, so that that electric eye integration information uh, effectively controls how long the shutter speed is open for uh, instead of the aperture, right? So if it's a really, um, if it's a really, like if you want to make the scene brighter, you move the electric eye and it lets less light in. Sorry, I'm just thinking out loud trying to describe this because this is going to be so confusing for people. But basically it electronically controls the length of time that tiny aperture is left open instead of mechanically doing it through that walking arm. And that only works if you're using magnesium flash bulbs. The issue is that with electronic flashes, the flash burst is not powerful enough to send... Oh, sorry, it's not that it's not powerful. It's not... It doesn't get flashed for a long enough duration to actually affect the integration cycle. And so basically it means that effectively the light dark wheel is disabled on a W shutter. So I always make the habit of converting them back. Um, and effectively what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to document where they've put this trace. And uh, then I'm going to remove their bodge. I'm just taking a bit of B-roll here on my phone. I'm gonna remove that bodge. I'm gonna redo the trace that they cut. And I'm basically gonna convert this W shutter back into the standard shutter because W shutters are really useless in terms of electronic flash. So I'll do that now, but uh, yeah, you will see the W insignia. Um, and a lot of you might wonder what on earth it means. Well, that's what it's for. Um, and again, it didn't last very long. Polaroid stopped doing it because they, they figured out that, well, that wasn't a very good solution either. Uh, maybe they found out that, yeah, it didn't work very well with electronic flash. And the reason that it works with bulb flashes is magnesium bulbs have a burn duration of 1 30th of a second whereas an electronic flash has a burn duration of, you know, one five thousand to, to, to one ten thousandth of a second. It's insanely fast. Now, last thing I'm going to do here, I am just going to use a bit of solenoid wire. 
So I've got an old solenoid here uh, that I've taken off a broken Polaroid 600. And uh, solenoid wire is really good to use for bodging. It's basically mylar wire, so it's insulated copper wire. So you basically just have to burn a little bit of the, um, burn a bit of that uh, insulated layer off and then uh, then you can um, solder it because you, you can't solder through that insulated layer. So I'm just going to attach one side here. And what I'm doing uh, as part of the modification uh, to form a W shutter, they actually cut a trace. Well, I'm making that trace again and just bridging it using the solenoid wire. I really like solenoid wire um, because it's free. I salvage it from broken cameras because my spirit animal is a womble and I recycle everything. But it's just really nice stuff to work with. much. All right, I'll just hit that with a bit of wick to clean up where I over-soldered because I don't need that much solder on the traces. I'll just test for continuity using a multimeter on the beep setting. So I'll just stick this on continuity mode and it should beep. So we want there. I follow that trace. Oh, they've actually. Oh, I should have made that. They've cut it in two spots. Well, that is frustrating. I did not notice that at all. Whoops. Why would they do that? They've, they've not only cut... <laughs> they've cut one part of the trays, and they've left another part cut as well, which they didn't need to do. It's like they've decided to cut the trace, and then the guy was like, oh, whoops, I forgot to cut the trace. But it's like, no, you already did that trace. My bad. Let me just re-solder this again with a longer bodge wire. Some of you that might have been watching at home might have noticed that and would have been yelling at your screens looking at the b-roll footage there. I did not see it. All the way up to here. I'll put a little right angle in it because why not, hey? And what I'll do, I'll hold this wire down with a bit of Kapton tape once it's all secure. But yeah, very strange that they cut the trace. Like they obviously really wanted to make sure that trace was cut. Now conversion of a W shutter back to standard is only really possible if you happen to have one of those walking arms in stock. I have several of them just taken from scrapped cameras. Uh, but if you don't have them, there's no way to convert it back to normal. Unless you were to like, I don't know, fabricate one of those walking arms. Which would be a lot of effort. But if I have the parts in stock on a camera that I'm refurbishing for someone, 
Um, well, I mean, this is my camera, so I want whoever owns it to be able to take flash photos. Um, I'll always give them the option if I have the parts. I say, look, do you want to make your camera more usable with flash? And then I'll just uh, I'll give them the option. So let's uh, just put a bit of capped on tape in place here. just to hold that wire down. And I'll put a little bit on the other side too. So, one W shutter converted to standard. I hope after doing this that this shutter works. <laughs> um, as I said, it's completely untested. I have faith. If not, this would just be a waste of time. Um, but at least you guys have learned a little bit about uh, the process and about W shutters and Fairchild versus Texas Instrument. And I'm just fishing out the aperture blades here, which we need to remove the anti static layer on. There we go. Look, this is, this is actually a good example. Uh, let me take some B roll of this. Um, this is actually a good example of the. Um, anti-static layer being really scuffed. So you can see here where some of the paints actually come off. Whoop, giant footage of my hand. And here as well, see how scuffed that is? So the paint here is flaking off. That's gonna cause these blades to be sticky if we don't address it. So I've got my jar. I got my acetone, which is very stinky. I've got a lid, and we're just gonna let that soak. And I'm gonna move on to the next part, which is going to be separating the lens cell. Now, on metal-bodied lenses like this, this is relatively easy, and it looks pretty brutal, but it's the easiest way to do it. Not often you use a hammer for refurbishing cameras. Basically what I'm doing is separating the front of the optical block from the rear of the optical block. It's held in place with epoxy, and it must be separated to clean in between the two layers. So there's two elements of glass cemented together, and then there's the rear lens element. And check out this absolute mushroom farm. That is disgusting. Look at that. That is just so gross. But you would be surprised, Polaroid's coating on the glass is actually pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this and you guys are gonna see the before and after of this fungus. Um, what I'm gonna do first is my little pencil trick because there's quite a bit of oxidization on the metal here, on the, the optical block, and this layer of graphite is gonna help those blades spin, slide past one another. This is super crucial to do. Like if you're opening one of these up, it's really helpful. I 
and I'm just doing this before I clean the lens since the uh, rough abrasive corroded metal causes the pencil to produce quite a bit of graphite dust and uh, we, we can clean that up now. Uh, Alright, now I just want to also do the same thing to that rear lens surface. And then we're going to clean this fungus up. Now, fungus has to be one of the most myth... M myth? Well, there's a lot of myths about it, that's for sure. One of the most misunderstood elements of photography and elements of camera collecting that there is. Because the second you have a lens with fungus and people describe it on a forum, everyone flips the hell out. They think it's like some kind of pandemic and they go, oh my God, do not store that fungusy camera with the rest of your stuff. That fungus is gonna spread. It's gonna spread people. Like it's the blob or something like that. That's not how fungus works. The little wisps of fungus that you see here are called mycelium. And they're like, it's like the body of the organism, right? So when you see a mushroom, Mushrooms are actually like the sexual reproductive organs of a fungus. The majority of the actual organism is that wispy white stuff. And fungus will grow just like mold and other similar things, lichen, etc. It'll grow where it's damp and where it's dark. It will not grow in the bright sun. Now the thing is that Fungus needs those conditions to survive, right? And it also needs nutrients from the soil. Glass isn't particularly nutritious uh, because it's made of silicon <laughs> and organic life forms are made of carbon. We can't eat glass and live off it and neither can a fungus, right? So what happens is fungal spores, which are invisible, they're microscopic, fungal spores go everywhere. Right? We're breathing them in right now as we speak. And it's fine, because they don't usually grow unless conditions are right. So when the conditions are very moist and very damp, fungus can grow. It can get onto the glass. It generally doesn't grow for very long, because, well, the organism needs nutrients to survive, and glass is not nutritious. And so it leaves behind a corpse of its mycelium. So you get those little wispy white bits left behind. So if you have a camera that's like 50 years old and got fungus at some stage, you don't have to worry about, you know, it's spreading to the rest of your cameras because that that's just not how it works. Like that fungus is very likely long dead and there's just as much fungus around in the atmosphere right now. What it needs and where people get confused is they think like, oh, one of my cameras got fungus and I kept it with the rest of my cameras and then a few months later they all had fungus. Well, it probably wasn't that one camera acting like a seed. It was the fact that conditions for all the storage of all the person's cameras was rubbish. You know, very damp, very dark. And so they all grew fungus around the same time. But it's not something you really have to worry about. Now, where fungus causes problems is one of two things. So the first is that if that mycelium grows very thick, um, basically it can block light traveling through the lens, which can make your photos very hazy. Now, the fungus would have to be like, you know, attack of the blob levels thick for that to happen. Um, but the bigger issue is that the fungus can eat into the coating of the glass, and that coating can then be destroyed uh, when you clean the, the lens cell. Uh, because the fungus basically removes it from the glass. Now that is very rare to happen on an SX-70. It can happen, but Polaroid's coating that they used, I mean Polaroid were the masters of coating back in the day. I mean Polaroid literally invented polarizing filters. They knew how to put stuff on glass, right? Of all the companies. And the lenses that they produced were really good quality in terms of their coatings. So even after that fungus, I mean, you guys saw the before video. Let's take some after shots because you guys are gonna be like, what the hell? Look at that. Right now, there's a, there's a few cleaning marks that I still need to get rid of, but the fungus is gone. 
Look at this. This is completely clean now. And you guys saw this one. This was the worst of them all. Uh, so this one I've got to clean the rear a little bit, I believe. Um, but yeah, we're, we're basically ready to put this thing back together again. Um, and so what we need to do is add a bit of epoxy before we click the lens cells back together. And I'm just really making sure that I've cleaned this as good as we possibly can. <sighs> Much better. All right. So I am gonna grab some glue and I'm gonna put it on one of my little bendy screwdrivers as a bit of epoxy. And basically what I'm gonna do, apologies if my head gets in the way, but we want to put just a small layer on the lens cell, just on the top there, where it's gonna connect, so that when the new lens, I mean, there's, a, there's really enough friction fit in these lenses for it to just kind of clip in, but you do want a bit of glue adhesive to help it stay in place as well. So you want that insurance policy basically. And that's what the epoxy is gonna do. Now, it is tempting to use super glue. I would not recommend that. Uh, super glue, which is cyanoacrylate, uh, produces a gas which, if it touches anything even remotely moist, will turn completely white and cloudy. And so that's probably the quickest way that you can make haze in your lens. Uh, you know, the quickest way to ruin your lens that you could possibly think of. All right, now, um, where the screwdriver went in, it produced a little mark. Um, it's not gonna, not gonna do anything, but I used that mark to align and get the lens cell back together again. There we go. And it makes a very satisfying click. And now what I can do is put the front cell back on. We need to clean that front cell. Um, but I can use that to just press it in. And that's it, that should be done now. So I'm gonna grab uh, my cleaning cloth, some more lens cleaner. <laughs> And yeah, so if you, like I said, if you go online, like people harp on about fungus so much and people will ask you, you know, well, like, what do, what do I use to clean it? And people are basically getting you to do chemistry lessons. They're like, you know, take hydrogen peroxide and alcohol and ammonia and you know, boil it all together. It's like, just get some glass cleaner and clean it off. <laughs> like, that's it. That's as simple as it is, seriously. Um, people make it so complicated just ridiculously complicated. Like, go to the store, buy some glass cleaner, and clean the lens. That's all you have to do. And as you guys can see, you know, it made absolutely short work of all that fungus. Even the front cell is coming along really, really nicely. There does appear to be just the tiniest tiniest bit of damage towards like the very edges of the lens cell but I think that's most likely due to oxidization of the coating uh, as opposed to any um, damage from the fungus <sighs> yes yeah, a little bit of oxidization to the coating just on this one surface on the rear of the front uh, helicoid. All right. All right, so we are back together. Um, what I'll probably do now is uh, redo the shutter blades, make sure I get all the acetone off them and 
Then we can put this shutter back together and give it a test. Now you guys would have already seen me reassembling a shutter in my first video that I did where I fully overhauled an SX70. So I'll probably, I'll probably leave it for now. Uh, but I just wanted to show you guys this particular shutter because I think it was pretty interesting. Being A, that it was a Fairchild, B, that it was a W variant of the Fairchild, indicating that it went back to the factory at some stage to get a factory upgrade, uh, which turned out to be a downgrade. Um, and C, it had crazy amounts of fungus in the lens, demonstrating just how overblown the issue of fungus is uh, in the photography community. Really, it's fine. The, the, the main thing is if it eats into the coating, which fortunately uh, doesn't tend to happen with SX-70s. The coating is incredibly strong. It can happen, but nine times out of 10, coating is gonna be just fine. And the fungus is relatively easy to remove. All right, bit of alcohol to remove some of the remains of that um, acetone. And then these blades are ready for reinstalling. So of course I'll uh, color them in with pencil as you guys would have seen in the last video. But yeah, that's really all I wanted to do today. So as always, if you found this video interesting, please feel free to share it. Feel free to like and subscribe, leave a comment. All of that kind of stuff helps me out. I mean, if you wanna send me a camera and have me fix it, I'm happy to do that for you too. I'm happy to custom make something. I'm happy to build you the camera of your dreams and get your SX-70 as refurbished as possible. Um, but, you know, if you don't wanna do that, if you have no money, if you can't help out a small business in that way, then all I ask, leave a comment, say, wow, that was interesting. You know, say, this was boring, like whatever it takes. Um, it really helps us small YouTubers out. And the truth of the matter is, instant photography is incredibly niche. I don't think I'm ever gonna hit a million subscribers. Honestly, if I managed to hit like 2000 one day, I would be over the moon and utterly beside myself in surprise. I really can't see that happening, but We'll see what happens. Uh, but yeah, you know, all that generic stuff like subscribe, yada, yada, yada. It all really, really helps. Um, the main purpose of this YouTube channel is really just for me to, I guess, document the repair of these cameras and demonstrate the skills required to refurbish them. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm just gonna keep doing videos as they come. So whenever clients have a camera, or if I get a camera that I think is interesting and warrants making a video about, I'll do just that. Um, I have had a few of you ask like when I'm gonna cover certain topics, like the SLR 680, et cetera. Um, truth of the matter is I'm gonna cover things as they come. Um, I'm only gonna be able to cover an SLR 690, for example, when someone sends me one for repair. I'm only gonna be able to cover a Model 3 when I get one of those, um, et cetera etc etc you want me to triple a battery motor polaroid spectra well i'm going to need one to repair first so it's all going to be a bit of a luck of the draw and really it'll just depend on what cameras i get into service uh, i was in talks with someone who wanted to send me a konica instant press uh, that would be a very cool camera to do a video on because there's very very little information out there about that model so it would be pretty sweet uh, if I could really be the first. Apparently it's got a bad range finder and it needs alignment. So I may do a video about that if I ever get that camera. Um, but yeah, what that means is uh, this channel is gonna be a real mixed bag. It's gonna be whatever Polaroid cameras, whatever instant cameras I end up getting to refurbish uh, based on what clients send me or what I happen to stumble upon or pick up myself. So it's gonna be a real mixed bag and that's why I recommend if you like that kind of surprise, uh, like and subscribe. 
so that you get notified. And you can hit that little bell icon as well, uh, which will keep you up to date. All right, I'm gonna pop this one last blade back in and uh, yeah, basically just reassemble this shutter, solder it onto this particular camera body and hope it works. Hope and pray, pray that it works. Uh, if it does work, I'll probably just do an update video. Like you'll see that this camera cameo, like make an appearance in another one of my videos. Um, I probably won't do, because I want to release this video today. Um, so I'll probably just end this one here and say thank you as always. You've been an utterly wonderful audience. And I will see you next time.